<clears throat> Sabbath peace. Sabbath peace. Another opportunity for us to hear and learn of the word of truth that's given to us by the most high God. All honor goes to the father through the son whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast and given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe in this state. You should expect no good thing from the most high. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it, to the saints watching in on the camera, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. Right? Let's go ahead and uh let's go ahead and kind of kind of kind of pick up where we left off last time. I'm going to go ahead and show on the screen. All right? So we can remember where we are with the kings. It would show me the wrong screen. So hold on. Give me a second here. All right. So we got to switch the screen. We want it to be that screen. That screen. There we go. All right. So. All righty. So if y'all can see the screen now, um, we left off with Jeroboam, right? And then Jeroboam, one of the things that the Most High God did for Jeroboam is he had, he gave Jeroboam some prophecy from Jonah. And Jeroboam, by Jeroboam's hand through the prophecy of the Most High God, he was able to rescue all of Israel, all of the northern tribes. So then uh, we also then after that talked about uh, Jonah. So then Jonah was a prophet, the same prophet that was sent to Jeroboam. Jonah was also sent to a place called Nineveh, right? So Nineveh is like way up north. I don't even know if I got it on this map. I should have got a map where we could see Nineveh. Let me see. Yeah, so I ain't got it, but Nineveh, Nineveh is like over here. It's off this side of the map, but it's like oh, way over here, right? So he went to a place called Nineveh. Nineveh is full of Gentiles. And uh, he didn't want to go, or no, sorry, he didn't go to a place called Nineveh. He was told to go to a place called Nineveh and prophesied to him. But Jonah didn't want to go, so he ended up hopping into a, a boat and going the opposite direction, right? So he went the opposite direction. The Most High God sent a storm on the boat. The people that he was on the boat with was like, why is all, what you got going on over there, bro? My bad. Go ahead, keep talking. <laughs> all right, yeah, so... Uh, he uh he he ended up going on this boat and everything starts shaking and moving and everybody thought they was about to die. He down there asleep. You know what I'm saying? And after all that, you know what I'm saying? The people was like, you down here asleep, you should be praying to your God. So then Jonah told him, like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Most high God mad at me. They was like, what should we do? He is like, throw me over. You know what I'm saying? Then they was like, uh, they was like, nah, we don't really want to do that. So they started looking for any other things they could do, but nothing was working. So they was like, all right. We got to throw him over. So ultimately, they threw him over. Jonah thought he was dead, uh, but a fish swallowed him up. So Jonah gave an account of, you know what I'm saying, like his whole journey in the water um, in the form of prophecy. And then after that, the fish spit him out, and he landed on the, uh, landed on the shore. And the Most High God told him now, like I told you the first time, take your butt on to Nineveh. And so he went to Nineveh. He was about a day into it, and he started prophesying to the people. And the people responded pretty quickly. They responded in a way to start dressing in sackcloth and ashes, which is, you know, what I'm saying showing that they were remorseful, that they repented. Um, and then after that, there was a fast for all the land, even the animals. The king of Nineveh was like, not even the animals can eat during this fast. Right. Everybody had to fast. And the most high God, then he the most high God chose not to continue with all the um, all the, uh, the the calamity he was about to bring on those people. Um, and that's the very thing that Jonah, Jonah expressed. He is like, that's the that's the main reason I didn't want to do this, because I knew that you was a merciful guy and I knew you were going to let them off the hook. 
right? So Jonah had something where he didn't want to really deal with these people like that. He didn't want to be, you know, so I like to imagine he didn't want to be known as the as the prophet that saved Nineveh. You know what I'm saying? It just seemed like seemed like, you know what I'm saying? Like he was he is hard pressed about that thing. But according to the book, he was he was distressed that he had to do it and especially that it was successful. So after that, you know what I'm saying, the most high God, you know what I'm saying? He kind of he kind of didn't even go home. He just kind of watched Nineveh from afar. And uh, after that, the Most High God, you know, had a gourd, which is kind of like think of it like a pumpkin and a potato. You know what I'm saying? It's like a, you know he had a big old gourd grow up and give him shade. It was big and it gave him shade. Then uh, after the, after it gave him shade, it withered away because a worm made it or something made it. You know what I'm saying? Then uh, uh, then you know he was he was happy when it gave him shade, and then he was mad. You know what I'm saying? When when it got taken away, and the Most High God used that to show him like. If you got if you got pity on this gourd that you didn't do nothing to create it, you didn't do nothing to make it grow up, you didn't do nothing for it, you didn't prune it, you didn't do nothing. It just grew up and it gave you shade and it went away. If you got pity on that, why wouldn't I have pity on Nineveh? You know what I'm saying? Which you know what I'm saying? I like I took Israel out, I helped y'all get into y'all land, I helped y'all get to where y'all get, and y'all still disobey me, right? Y'all still disobey me. I just sent you as a prophet to uh, Jeroboam. To, to save, you know what I'm saying, Israel by his hand, you know what I'm saying, and y'all y'all did that in disobedience, you know what I'm saying, and I've helped y'all, I've given y'all all I got, you know what I'm saying, I didn't, I didn't guide y'all through the wilderness, I didn't did miracles, gave y'all your own land, I didn't give y'all commandments, he like, I ain't did nothing for this people, why wouldn't I have pity on this, this people too, you know what I'm saying, so he kind of used that to illustrate something, and in a, in a larger message, it illustrates that the Most High God has pity on the Gentiles too, a lot of times us as Israelites, especially as we feel like we feel like we've been wronged by by every nation in this in this world, which is likely true. Right. But we, we kind of feel like we we got we we got select and elect. And therefore, you know, what I'm saying no one else, you know, what I'm saying no one else can get in. And that's not necessarily the case. All right. That's not necessarily the case. So this kind of demonstrates for us that the most high God does have pity on the Gentiles um, and, and it'll do us well to know that. So then let's uh let's kind of jump into the next thing here. We we talked about Jeroboam, right? So this is Jeroboam. We talked about him. We talked about Jonah. So now we need to jump on down. We already talked about Amaziah in the in the kingdom of Judah. So now we need to talk about Uzziah, right? So we're about to jump on down. We're gonna talk about Uzziah. We see it's a few other prophets. We got Amos and we got Hosea that we're gonna cover. Uh probably won't cover today, but you know what I'm saying? We'll we'll see what we get to. So let's talk about Uzziah. We're going to go to, mm, what are we going to look at? Chronicles, what I want, Chronicles. <clears throat> What's the last Chronicles we read? You got it over there? Uh, let's see. The last book of Chronicles. Second Chronicles. 20, 25. 25. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, it should be yeah, 25. So yeah, it must be 26. So let's do Second Chronicles chapter 26. Let's go ahead and switch it back to the big cam. Money in the bank. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Let me see if that's what we're looking for. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. He built mm -hmm. Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept. How old was he now? Uh, 16. This is a 16-year-old, right? They took a 16-year-old because his dad died, right? His dad, Amaziah, died. So after that, they took a 16 year old and they was like, OK, well, you know what I'm saying? You're the next in line. You become king. But watch how this 16 year old. I, I like to point this out because a lot of times what we see in the book are, are with older gentlemen. Now, we saw I don't know if y'all remember Joash. Right. And uh, uh, Joash, am I getting that right? Or is it uh, Joe? Uh, no, yeah, Joash, is... Joash, Joash. Yeah. So yeah, Joash. Yeah, he was he started he started ruling like at, at seven. You know what I'm saying? But he was raised by the priest. You know what I'm saying? You can kind of imagine that the priest was making a lot of them decisions for him. We don't get that impression from from uh from uh Uzziah. 
right? When we look at Uzziah, he come on the scene, he's 16 years old. Now watch what we hear about him. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. His mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did mm -hmm. that which was right in the sight of Yahuwah, according to all that his father Amaziah did. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as mm -hmm. long as he sought Yahuwah, God made him to prosper. And he went mm -hmm. forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jebne and the wall of Ashdod and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. And God helped right, him. Right, so the Philistine. you kind of got to look at you kind of got to look at the areas that 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 he was uh he was kind of taking over here. So let's go ahead and switch it over to the map. All right. So it says the Philistines. So now if we look at this, that's going to be in this area right here. All right. So it say he took what? Ashdod. Ashdod right here. What else? Gath. And he broke down the wall of Gath. Mm -hmm. We don't have Gath on this map, but it's right in this area. And what else? Build cities about Ashdod among the Philistines. Right. So this is the area that he's in right now. All right. He's taking this area. This is the kingdom of Judah. So this is this is the kingdom that he runs over. This is Jerusalem. So this is where the temple and the palace is. So he coming like straight over. Right. And trying to gain territory in this area right here. All right. Keep going. And he saw God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding and the visions of God. And as long as he mm -hmm. sought Yahuwah, God made him prosper. And mm -hmm. he went forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jebne and the wall of Ashdod and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians that dwelt in Gerbeal and the Mehunims and the Ammonites right. gave gifts to Uzziah. So now the Arabians is going to likely be on the other side. You know what I'm saying? And then down below. So he's taking, he's basically getting all the borders of, of Judah. And he's trying to shore up all those borders. You know what I'm saying? Let's keep going. And the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah. And his name spread abroad even to the entering in of Egypt. For he strengthened mm -hmm. himself exceedingly. Moreover, mm -hmm. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate, and at the turning of the wall, and fortified them. Also he built towers in the desert, and digged many wells, for he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains, husbandmen also in vineyards in the mountains, in the Cam and, in, and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. Moreover, mm -hmm. Uzziah had a host of fighting men that went out, by, that went out to war by, hand, by bands, according to the number of their account by the hand of Jael, the scribe, and Messiah, the ruler under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The whole number mm -hmm. of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600, and under their hand was an army, 300,000 and 7,500, that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And as I right, so he got a strong, he got a strong army. They ain't scared of none of that, right? Keep going, watch this. And Isaiah prepared for them throughout all the hosts, shields and spears and helmets and hebergrons and bows and slings to cast stones. All right, so he got all his people weaponry, right? So he, this, you know what I'm saying? He started at 16, not saying he's doing this at 16, but he started at 16 and, and now he's just trying to build up his army. He's taking over places around them. So the Most High God is giving them strength. And the books say the Most High God was with them as long as he is obedient. You know what I'm saying? As long as he sought after the Most High God. All right, keep going. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on towers and upon the bulwarks, warped, mm -hmm. to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And, he named, and his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Right. And so you see here, this is like this is kind of a, a look at like technology advancing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? When they say that he, he built engines, you know what I'm saying? It's like these are these are things that you wouldn't have heard about back when we were running around with Moses. All right. So at this point, we've advanced in such a way that we've learned how to build like certain mechanics where we can we can kind of launch an arrow from a larger contraption. 
and launch like, you know what I'm saying, little flaming fireballs, you know what I'm saying, on people. So he building up all these towers, not just in Israel, outside of Israel, as you get closer to Israel, uh, in Judah, rather, you know what I'm saying? As you get closer to Judah, he's building up these towers where it's like, you got to see about me before you get here. So if you come here, if you get close with a problem, before you even get to my territory, I got little places where I can see you and I might get at you. Right. So he's trying to protect his nation. He's trying to protect his people. All right. Keep going. And you have to remember his dad and his grandfather, all them. We was all, you know, what I'm saying we all kind of got beat up on by other places, whether it be Edom and whether it be, you know, what I'm saying the Syrians. You know, what I'm saying? we've been we've been forced to have to give up some of our stuff. You know what I'm saying? They came in and robbed us. So he probably looking at these stories and looking like, no, 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 no. We can't. You know what I'm saying? We seen we seen this play out before. We got to kind of get our stuff together. So he start arming his army up. He start taking over the places around his border to kind of give itself more land. You know what I'm saying? Then he starts setting up towers around. You know what I'm saying? Just to make sure it's like, OK, if these boys even get close, we're going to know about it before they even get here. And we got something for them as they get close. Right. Keep going. For he was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed mm -hmm. against Yahuwah his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of Yahuwah that were valiant men. And they withstood. All right, so read that again. Watch this. Azariah the priest went in after him. No, 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 no. A little bit further back. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. There you he go. Tra he transgressed. When he was strong. His heart was lifted up to his destruction. So all this time, he had been serving God. He had been seeking after God. He went after the prophet. What was the prophet's name? Was it Jedediah? Zechariah. It was Zechariah. So Zechariah, uh, you know what I'm saying? He was going after the prophet Zechariah, and Zechariah was speaking to him, giving him instruction, right? And he followed the Most High God and served the Most High God. Not now, baby girl. Daddy doing study. Go check your mom. Go ask your mom. Right? So Zechariah, Zechariah was sitting there giving them the game right from the most high God. And he was following after it. But he became so strong. Right. His army was strong. He feeling like, man, these boys ain't messing with me. Then he get to a point where his heart was lifted up. Right. His heart was lifted up. Then he started, you know, getting a little, you know what I'm saying, getting a little loose. You know what I'm saying? So look at look at look at what that looseness can do. For he transgressed against Yahuwah his God and went into the temple of Yahuwah to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Right? So he, he transgressed and he said, you know what? Priest, y'all not doing it right. Let me show you how to do that. You got to light a little incense over here. Now, we've already learned. We learned from the book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers that there is only one group of people genetically. Like, we're not even talking about, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can't go to enough school to do this. I don't care how many degrees you got. I don't care what qualifications you got at your job. There's no way that you're supposed to go into the temple and light incense at the table of incense unless you are a son of Aaron, period. But he walks in not being a son of Aaron. He's a son of Judah. Right. He walks in. And let's see what happens next. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him, 80 priests of the Lord that were valued. Mm -hmm. And now these are all priests, meaning that they were sons of Aaron. Right? Our priests, the priests we talking about in Judah, it ain't like the priests in Israel. Anybody can be a priest in Israel. Y'all remember last week, you know what I'm saying? We was talking about, uh, oh, no, 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 that wasn't last week. No, we, no, we probably going to talk about probably next week. You know what I'm saying? I was reading this. But, yeah, next week. We're going we gonna to learn about some of the priests of uh, uh, Israel. But weeks ago, we were talking about priests of Israel, right? And the priests of Israel, anybody could be a priest. Jeroboam made it that anybody could be a priest. You walk up, just be like, yeah, okay. It's kind of like today. If you want to go, look, if you want to go marry somebody, right, and officiate the marriage, you just go right downtown. You know what I'm saying? Apply for a couple things, submit some paperwork, pay a little bit of money. You are now, they're going to look at you. Up. You know what I'm saying? That little silly stuff they be doing. You are now <laughs> a priest. They got your butt just like that. Pay a little 20 off. 
You know what I'm saying? You give them a little 20 dollars, you give them a little 20, you know what I'm saying? They make you a priest right now. Because anybody could be a priest. And that's how I was with Jeroboam. That's where these people get it from. Right? But not us. With us, it was genetic. Like a lot of times you you would hear, you know what I'm saying? One of the things that, that y'all gonna hear me say when we do our fellowship hour, you know what I'm saying? Y'all go hear me say, look, you know what I'm saying? You ain't got no business teaching or preaching to a man if you are a woman. That's book. I ain't trying to offend nobody. Ain't none of that. We're going to talk about it, though, right? Because that is something that the most high God set up. It ain't nothing I can control. Ain't nothing you can control. It don't matter how much we like it, how much we think it's fair. The same way Isaiah might feel, he might feel like, what you mean? I'm the king. I'm just as wise as any of the. I might be smarter than the priest. Isaiah might know the Bible way better than any of the priests out there. Let's just say, let's say he know the word. I got Zachariah standing right next to me. Y'all going to challenge me with the word? Y'all still reading it out of the scriptures. Y'all reading the law from what Moses wrote down. Zachariah, tell it to me. He tell it to me straight from God's mouth. When, Zach, when the most I got say something to Zachariah, it come right to me. Isaiah might feel like, man, I'm that God. Nobody know the book better than me. That's how he might feel that way. And guess what? Your butt still can't light the incense. Because it ain't got nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter how much you know, how much you think of yourself, how strong you are, how, 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 how much you run your household. None of that matters. You have to meet the qualifications that the Most High God set up. That goes for anybody. That's the mindset that we got to have. I'm not about to sit here and argue with a man. He got to listen. I used to go to a church when I was younger. This man, this man had a church. Right. While we was going to the church, divorced his wife. His wife sat in the back of the church while he got remarried to another wife. All this while church is going. Through the course of going to church, this man divorced one wife. She sitting in the back. He think he got another wife. Really, he committing adultery on his first wife that's back there in the back. Right. And he been preaching the whole time. Now, I didn't know nothing about the book back then. But had I been sitting under some foolishness like that, I'd stand right up and be like, Yo, but can't, you can't you can't preach. You can't lead a congregation. You just can't do it. That's book. Book say you got to be a husband of one wife if you want to lead a congregation. That's it. If a man got, he never been married. Man, never been married. Right? Never been married. Never had a wife. You think I'm going to sit under that? No. You, just like a woman can't preach, man, you can't run a congregation, period. You can contribute. You can help out. You can sweep the floor a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? If you want to write down, be like, oh, this is what I think would be a good teaching. You could share it with a with an appropriate bishop or pastor. He'd be like, oh, this is what I think you should do. And if he want to take it, he can. But you can't do it. There's rules to this and that it's an order that the most high God set up. We, we anybody who been in church, who my church people, Sister Pamela, you've been in a couple churches in your lifetime. You know what I'm saying? Sister Sharon, I'm pretty sure you've been to a couple churches in your lifetime. You go to some of these man. churches, you go to some of them churches and these people speaking in tongues. They be saying, oh, shabba, lamba, 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 lamba. Oh, shut up. You know what I'm saying? Just, just speaking in tongues. They doing the most. But the book give us an order. We ain't got to go to it right now. But the book give us an order. It say no more than three people should be speaking in tongues. That's book. That's a book. It say I didn't make it up. I didn't put it there. The book say no more than three people. Then after it tell you no more than three people, because, you know, a Christian, oh, a Christian, I light that thing up. Oh, give, give me the first three people speaking in tongues. They all just start speaking it together. So. Paul saw that coming. So Paul said, and when you got those three people, they got to do it in course. In other words, they got to do it one at a time. And then, so you know a Christian to take that, they eat that up too. They'd be like, all right, only one person. Let me get three people speaking to only one of y'all can speak in tongues at a time. Christian to still eat that up. But then Paul hit him with the last piece. He said, oh, and don't do it unless it's an interpreter. I haven't been to one, all the churches I've been to in my life. I've never seen one person speaking or one group, one church speaking tongues according to the order that's set, that set forth in our book. But that's what separates the real from the fake. That's why I can stand on and be like, 
I don't care what spirit y'all say y'all getting it from. It's not according to the book. Period. So this stuff don't confuse me. It confuses a lot of people because we don't know. It confused me when I was younger because I didn't know. I didn't know what it was supposed to look like. But as you can see, when Uzziah stepped foot inside of that temple, it didn't confuse Uzziah. I mean, it didn't confuse, confuse them priests. Them priests were looking like, oh, no, that's not appropriate. How many is they came in there? 80 of them boys. Like, what you doing in here? And that's the king. It's the king of, it's the king of Judas. It's our king. You think they care? 80 of them boys walked up on him like, hold on, what you doing? Because guess right, the sons of Aaron is the king when you step into the temple. You get to doing too much, it's a different authority. Sit your butt down and go, you have authority over what God gave you. But now Isaiah, he want a little more. He said, I, should, I feel like I should be lighting the, lighting the incense too. We got to understand what our position is and what our role is. Sometimes we jump out and try to move too darn fast, too darn fast, man. We try, we just get a little something. Most high God give us a little something, and we don't know how to handle it. You gotta understand, everything is a test. Everything is a test. That's why in the very beginning, what we talk about, we say, listen, we say, no matter what happens, whether it's a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and will be used against you in the day of judgment. What that saying is. You, it's a test for you. If you have good things happening to you, what's happening is the most high God say, are you going to deal with it? Are you going to still be faithful according to what he gave you? Or are you going to take it, speak tongues to somebody and start acting out of order and sin it? Misrepresenting his people. That's what we have to stray away from. We spend our whole life trying to get as close as possible to sin. Then we slip up, right? That's what we call it. We slip up and we, we start sinning. Then we feel all bad about ourselves. Oh, I just can't play. I just don't know why I can't get it right. God, can you just. No, sit your butt down. Don't put that. Well, we put everything on God, man. We, we The man did his part. He gave us the whole book. After giving us the whole book, gave us prophets to come warn us and tell us stuff. After giving us the prophet, sent his son down to die for it. Gave us more information through his apostles. Wrote it all down, patched it up. Then we were slaves as punishment. He trying to let us know, okay, I give it to you, you don't take it. Let me punish you. But then even in his mercy, he had the whole book translated into English as we got conquered by, most of us got conquered by English-speaking nations. And when we went to the Spanish-speaking nations, he had it translated into Spanish. The King James got spread everywhere. It ended up being translated into every language that we got conquered in. In his mercy. And he gave it to us so we have it. And we still disobeying. We still jumping around, running around, looking crazy in these people's churches. There's a whole line of churches right down the street right there. Every Sunday I'll be wanting to go over there and tell them, boy, they don't know what they darn doing. Just making a mess with these people. Leading the people darn astray. But the fact of the matter is, you know what the reality is? The reality is, even if they sat and they taught the people the truth, even if they gave them the unadulterated truth, it would turn their churches from a from a from a membership of 300 to about three. And that's difficult when you got to pay for this church. You still making payments. I need that tithe in. I need the darn offering. Why well, ain't crazy? Y'all ain't about to see me about opening up. What y'all think of open up a church? You know what I'm saying? I ain't gonna see her right out the darn house. Y'all ain't about to y'all ain't about to leave me with the bill because I didn't say something y'all didn't like. You know what I'm saying? No, we all right. You know, they do the thing right online. You know what I'm saying? This is how the thing works. These people, listen, these people, even if they these people are sitting in your face like you playing a song, Ezekiel said. These people are sitting in your face and don't believe a word. Don't follow a word of it. How long do you think that's going to last? Till you say something that make them feel uncomfortable. Now it's like, oh, well, you know what? I don't even feel. Every one of us. How many, how many of us? How many of us when we, when, you know what I'm saying, get or find ourselves caught in sin? How many of us feel like, okay, that's when I need to open up my Bible? No, that, that would be doing a number on us. Oh, I ain't even, I ain't even good. At, I ain't even the right state to open the Bible. You know, oh, I don't even. You know what? I want to say a prayer, but you know what? 
I mean, the way what's on my mind and how sinful my thoughts are right now, I shouldn't even say no prayer right now. That's the, that's the trick. Right? The devil's job is to separate us from God. Ain't nothing separates you, you obey the man. Only thing that separates you is sin. But what we do is we try to get as close as possible to sin, thinking we got it, thinking it's cool. Then we slip. That's what we like to call it, slip. Oh, Isaiah ain't slip. He just walked in there. 80 of them boys walked up on him. Let's hear about it. What did it say? 80 of them boys. I love this thing. You know what I'm saying? 80 of them boys walked up like, what? You know what I'm saying? If you don't get your butt up out of here, watch these boys. Watch it. And they withstood Isaiah the king and said to him, it pertains not unto you, Isaiah, to burn incense unto Yahuwah, but to the Can I translate that for you? Can I translate? I just want to translate. He said, it pertains not on you. It said, he said, it pertains not unto you to burn incense to Yahuwah. Let me translate that. Boy, this ain't got nothing to do with you. You ain't got no business. Then boy, tell him, boy, no, nah, this thing ain't got nothing to do with you. Get your butt out of here. Boy, what's wrong with you? Keep going. Watch this. But to the priest. I like Isaiah too. You know what I'm saying? That's a bad boy. He started at 16. That's a bad boy. I like how he started off. But oh boy, you can't mess with the priest now. Them boys will get you. All right, keep going. But to the priests, the sons of Aaron, mm -hmm. that are consecrated to burn incense, go out of the That's sanctuary, for you have trespassed. Neither mm -hmm. shall it be for thee, neither shall it be for thine honor from Yahuwah God. Then mm -hmm. Isaiah was wroth and had a censer in his hand. To burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of Yahuwah from beside. Watch it. Look, look, look. Altar. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So listen, 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 listen. See, I, I need y'all to appreciate what's happening right now, right? So who remembers what we were supposed to do with a leper? Cast them out. So where were the lepers supposed to stay? Outside the camp. If y'all remember, what king was that? If y'all remember, the Syrians came and besieged us in Judah, right? And they besieged us. We just read this maybe four weeks ago, right? The king came and besieged us. The king of Syria came and uh, besieged us in Judah. And the Most High God ended up scaring away the armies of the Syrian overnight. Remember, we was in there eating ourselves. Right. We had eaten. It was it was women trying to figure out what what child they was about to eat. You know what I'm saying? Like we was out there eating. Right. Nasty stuff because we didn't have no food. Who was outside the camp that learned that all these people was ran away and it's just a whole bunch of resources down at their camps outside our gates. It was the lepers. Remember, it was two lepers. They was outside the camp. That's where the lepers stayed. They were outsiders. We didn't mess with no lepers. The pre according to our law, the lepers had to be locked up or distanced outside of the camp until the uh, until the, the priest checked them. And if they confirmed it was leprosy, they had to go. Right. So leprosy is an unclean thing. The most High God showed that is unclean. Let me tell you the last place that something unclean is supposed to be inside the temple. So it's, it's important how serious this is to the priest, right? They got strict protocols on leprosy. Leprosy, somebody with leprosy ain't supposed to touch nothing. You know what I'm saying? It ain't supposed to be nowhere near y'all's temple. This is a serious thing. So Uzziah's talking. While he's talking, he got leprosy. He got the sensor and he got leprosy to start breaking out on his darn forehead. Notice it's on his forehead. So it ain't like it's breaking out somewhere that the that the priest can't see. No, it's breaking out right where they looking at him at. They looking at him in his eye and then they look above his eyes and you just see this thing just spreading right on his face. He's just having an outbreak of leprosy right there. It's, he's a black man. It's a, I like to believe Uzziah was dark skin. You know what I'm saying? That boy, black man, all of a sudden, it just starts spreading right there on his face. White. You know what I'm saying? The whole forehead just starts spreading, slowly just turning white. Watch how the priest react to this thing. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence 
Yea, himself hasted also to go out because Yahuwah had smitten him. And Isaiah uh -huh. was a leper until the day of his death and dwelt in the several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Isaiah, first and last, did, did Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, write. So Isaiah slept right. with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of the burial which belonged to the kings. For they said, he is a leper, and Jotham, his son, reigned in his stead. Right? So now we end up getting to, to, to the king of Judah named Jotham, right? But he, he was actually alive while his dad was alive. His dad just had to kind of sit on the side. He put, the books say he put him in a several house. In other words, a house that was separated, right? So he put him in a house that was, that was separated from, uh, from the people. Yeah, outside the city, right? Because that's our law, right? So this Uzziah, and then you have Jotham, that ends up kicking in right after him, right? So Uzziah continued to live a little bit, but Jotham, Jotham is uh, the ruler at, the, at that point. But now, before we start to get into Jotham, I want us to kind of get into the other kings of Israel. So we left off with Jeroboam. So I want us to get into Zechariah and uh, Shelem, and maybe even we might have time to get into uh, Maniah. So let's go to... Uh, let's go to... Let's go to 2 Kings 15. We left off on 14, right? Uh, yep. Okay, so let's go to 2 Kings 15. Let's see if we can pick up on these other kings. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. 16 mm -hmm. years old. 16 years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned two and 50 years in Jerusalem. Right, so Azar, this is still talking about Uzziah. Mm -hmm. So in the book of Kings, it's, it's calling him Azariah, but uh, in the book of uh, Chronicles, they call him Uzziah, but it's the same person. And his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, except that the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burnt incense still on the high places. And Yahuwah smote the king so that he was a leper until the day of his death and dwelt in a several house. And Jotham, the right. king's son, was over the house, judging the people of the land. The rest of the... All right, so you can see that the same thing happened to him here in the book of Kings. So it's just, it's just letting you know it's the same person. It's just a different name, right? So that's Uzziah. That's what we just read in the book of Chronicles. But let's keep going. And all that he did, and they were... Uh, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Azariah slept with his fathers and they buried him in his fathers with his fathers in the city of David and Jotham, his son, reigned in his stead. Mm -hmm. In the 38th and eighth year of Azariah, king of Judah, did Zechariah, son of Jeroboam, reign over Israel and Samaria six months. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahuwah, as his fathers had done. He departed not mm -hmm. from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and smote him before the people and slew him and reigned in his stead. The rest of the acts of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. This was right. The word so Zechariah's time was real short, right? Zechariah came in there because remember Jeroboam, Most High God wasn't pleased with Jeroboam, although he sent Jonah to 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 give Jeroboam the instructions to rescue all the people of Israel. It's only because the Most High God wasn't ready to cut off Israel at that point, right? But the Most High God wasn't pleased with Jeroboam, so now his son, just like many of the other. Uh, kings of israel his son ended up bearing the the reaping reaping the uh the the fruit of of his actions right so the most high god visited on his son he had a short kingdom and then the next guy get in so now let's hear about shalom this was the word of the lord which he spake unto jehu saying thy son shall sit on the throne of israel unto the fourth generation and so it came to pass right shalom. so yeah that's a good point right we almost forgot about that let me let me take y'all back to that so now let's look at this, All right? So this is looking at the gen generation. So we talked about this before. This is the kingdom of Judah. You can see it goes straight, pretty much goes straight down, right? Outside of just like a little movement and a little movement here, kingdom of Judah goes straight down because it's all coming directly from David, right? And all this is just him passing it down to his own family. But 
when you look at the kingdom of Israel, it don't have, it don't follow that same thing. You got Jeroboam, then you got Nadab, then it switch over to a whole different bloodline. Then you got Baasha, then you got Elah, then it switch over to another bloodline, Zimri, then Amri, then he passes down to you know what I'm saying three generations he got that run in his family, but then you know what I'm saying uh, and it's four people all together. Then he kick it over to Jehu. So remember Jehu because Jehu ended up getting rid of Omri's uh, bloodline and he got rid of all of the people of Baal that, that served Baal, all of the prophets that served Baal and the people that worship Baal. From there, Jehu was given it for uh, four generations. So this is a uh, one, two, three, four, well, you know, four after him, right? So one, two, three, four generations right here. So after that, Zechariah had to give it up. And now Shalom is about to step in. So you'll see that he kept it. He's the only one that kept it in his family for that long. You know what I'm saying? All the rest of them, they have it for one, two generations all together. He had all together five generations. All right. Yeah, uh, hold on. Let me let me ask the sister Pamela question. She said, "What now?" Uh, answer sister Pamela question. So in in Chronicles, it tells us about more about his life and what he did, and he said he was doing right until he got strong and then did what he did in the temple. But then Kings give us more Kings and Chronicles. You work with in tandem; they don't contradict each other. Kings might give you a little bit more of what was happening, and Chronicles might give you. A little bit more of what was happening and you put those together and that that's like the sum of it right kind of like the gospels is some things in john that were explained that might not have been explained in matthew so when kings would say the high places wasn't taken down it's not that Isaiah was like uh it's not that Isaiah like did anything wrong it's like these places were always there you know what i'm saying but wherever Isaiah was taking care of his land and taking care of the city and stuff like that it was like Okay, he got it. He put on for God, but far away or in the outskirts and the high places is still like altars were still there. Uh, maybe they were like using those altars. Maybe they wasn't. It was just still there, you know. So it could yeah, the be book said, the book don't say he used them. Yeah, it was yeah, just saying that, case, that he didn't take it down. Some kings would probably be like, no, we don't mess with that, right? So nobody would go up there, but they still would be there. So we don't know mm -hmm. what what that case was. So you got to like work it. You got to look at Kings and Chronicles to work in tandem. They don't contradict. It's just telling you. Kings gives you more detail or Chronicles give you more detail. You put it together for the for the totality of the story. Yeah, generally the book of Kings is is kind of is kind it kind of glosses over if you like these kings that we just read about like Zechariah, you can see it didn't really give us real details about his life. It didn't go into a real details about his life. So the book of Kings is kind of like it's it's real quick, right? except for certain things like it, it goes into a lot of detail about uh about uh the prophet elijah and those situations but for a lot of these kings is really short and quick what you'll notice about the book of chronicles is the book of chronicles focuses on the books i mean the the kings of judah so sometimes the kings of israel is mentioned in there but it's really about the kings of judah when we look at the book of chronicles so because the book of chronicles is focused only on the kings of judah a lot of times you get a lot more information about their lives in the book of Chronicles than you do the book of Kings because the book of Kings is just kind of giving you a pretty high level. Most of the time it's kind of giving you a pretty high level of what happened and then moving on to the to the next one, unless it was some real significant event that wasn't documented somewhere else. But you'll see that Kings is going to reference and be like, yeah, you know, what I'm saying? everything else needs to be talked about. You can read it in the book of Chronicles. So it's like because the book of Chronicles covered it. You know what I'm saying? I'm not about to go into a whole lot of details on it. So you could tell that in a lot of cases, the writings in the book of Chronicles were written before, you know what I'm saying, the, the writings in the book of Kings. And the book of Kings is just kind of giving you an overall and, and sometimes documented details that wasn't captured somebody somewhere else. And then, you know what I'm saying, they're kind of moving on from there. You got another one in here? Why are we going back and forth so I can understand? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I try to, I try to, I try to remember like which ones cover more in more detail. Cause it's, it's the same. A lot of times it's just the same. You could read either one, but for some of them, it's like, like this one, for example, it's a lot more detail in, uh, in Chronicles. 
So when I can remember that when there's a lot more detail, you know what I'm saying, we'll, we'll, we'll try to read those. Let's keep going. So, so the T you um, there? To talk to, yeah, my bad. To talk to I'm uh, I was answering uh Mr. Sharon. Uh yeah, like so she said it's two perspectives. That's true. So I was saying it's not like they got to get together and decided to split the story. Um, it's because it was written in, yeah, it was written in different times and by different people. And that's how you like validate the authenticity of the book. They say the Bible was written by such and such. It's like, bro, like the fact that this never contradicts and the stories are the same and they hold true to everything that Moses already said and knowing that they were written by different people at different times and they still work in tandem and like there's no contradiction and like you can't find any holes in it that lets you know like this was like this was the spirit of god moving in these people to write these things because there's nowhere there's no account in history of anybody putting together all of these books that's talking about the same god and none of them contradict that's a fact so that's that's impossible to do, right? Like if like if the you know if Shakespeare wrote a book about about love, you know what I'm saying, and then like and then like all of these people come around and write a book about love, it's gonna be about it's gonna be different in their perspective. But if if the Most High God tell you, okay, this is what love is in the, in his in the scriptures, then you know then every prophet, every every apostle, everybody that write in this book is gonna say the exact same thing and have the exact. That's why. Brother Phil jump around a lot and show you the same idea from when Moses was walking around, probably like 4000 BC. And then when Paul was walking around, probably like 33 AD, have, they never met each other, don't know each other at all. But they say the exact same thing about the exact same God that moved that God told that God moved on them to tell that story. And it's all works in tandem after like thousands of years of like disconnection. Another person can get the spirit and pick it, pick right back up and say the exact same thing. Yeah, then you think about that. <laughs> you think about that. It's already written down. The prophets already came together. This miracle of a book already put together by all these different people at different times, like Brother T said. And then you think about that. We read this book, and you got 30,000, 33,000 different Christian denominations that can't agree on what was already written. Stuff that people already wrote down, that they already agreed on. They ain't talked to each other. They at different times. Some of them popping up hundreds of years apart from each other and they agree on everything they talking about. And you can't get the Christians to agree on what's already written down. It tells you the different spirits that people are working on. Right. One is created by the most high and his spirit. The other one is created by who knows. You know what I'm saying? Who knows? You know what I'm saying? Whining spirits is what they create. These people drunk. You know what I'm talking about? These people don't want whining spirits. All right. But let's keep going. Any other? Did we have some more questions to come through? Not we can get you good now. All right, let's go ahead. What we got? You got the personal interpreter? Absolutely. Okay. That's and Shalom the son of and Shalom the son of Jabesh began to reign in the nine and thirtieth year of Uzziah, king of Judah. And he reigned a full month in Samaria. For mm -hmm. Menahem, the son of Gadai, went up from Tirzah and came to Samaria and smote Shalom, the son of Jabesh in Samaria, and slew him and reigned in his stead. And the rest of the acts so of Shalom. Manahem so Manahem, he came, he came from where? Uh, from Tirza. Right? Manahem came down from Tirza and he found Shelem. He was like, boy, you fool. Bow! You know what I'm saying? Rock that boy. Killed him. He was like, yeah, now I'm going to take the kingdom. Right? Because you have to look at it in Israel, Jehu had it. Right? He had it. But Israel, it's up for grabs. It's always up for grabs. So you got to be strong if you in Israel. You can't come around here like people ain't got no rule of law. Anybody can be a priest. People be serving whatever they want to serve. It's not as much structure and not as much respect out there. So it's up for grabs. That's why Zechariah, they start when they saw the weakness, what they do. You know what I'm saying? Shalom jumped out and he got Zechariah. So when you show that, we ain't seen that in a long time. You know what I'm saying? It's probably nobody who's living who's seen the last time that somebody killed a king and took over because that didn't happen until Jehu and Jehu had kids and kids and kids. This on the fifth generation of his kingdom. So it's a, everybody who living at this point, 
Man, I mean, we heard it. We heard Israel used to get down like that. We ain't seen it. Shalom was like, I'm still about that. So he go out there, he find Zechariah, he kill him. Bow. You know what I'm saying? So after that, Manan was like, okay, well, if you got him, what's it? I know you ain't even like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, I can take you. So he went out and he got him some of Shalom. Right? So now Manan, he got it. Let's see. Let's, let's read about him. And the rest of the acts of Shalom and his conspiracy, which he made, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. Mm -hmm. Then Menahem smote Tifsa and all that were therein and the coast thereof from Tirzah, because they opened not to him. Therefore, he smote it and all the women therein that were with child. He ripped up in the nine and thirtieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, began Menahem, the son of Gadai, to reign over Israel. And he reigned 10 years in Samaria. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahuwah. He departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And Pul, mm -hmm. the king of Assyria, came against the land. And Menahem gave Pul a thousand talents of silver that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. And Menahem. Now, this is important. This is very important. This is why I wanted to make sure we got to him. So Menahem, he's, he's the one. He came in and he made a rug. He did some foul stuff. Right. He went to he went to what is the city? Tirza, which is the city he came from. And he started ripping up the people there because they didn't let him in. They didn't respect him the way he wanted to be respected. So he started ripping up the women and even the women that had children. Right. So he did some foul stuff. But then after that, the king of Assyria came. So we haven't we talked about Syria, but not Assyria. Right. They're near each other. Well, now they're not even really near each other. Nineveh is near Assyria. So I'm gonna get another map next week, and we gonna I'll show you guys Nineveh where it is on the is map. Assyria, ain't it? Huh? Nineveh is Assyria, right? Nineveh is in Assyria. Uh, not well. At when Assyria becomes an empire, yeah. Oh, okay. I don't think so. I don't think so from the beginning. Like at this point, I don't think so. Hmm. I think it's two different people. You know what I'm saying? Or two different two different uh, sections of people. You know what I'm saying? But Nineveh is near Assyria. And Assyria comes, the king of Assyria comes, and he comes down there and he looking like, yo, 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 what you got going down here? So I told y'all how we haven't really faced Nineveh in the book yet, right? Now this is the first time that we facing Assyria. So obviously, Manahem, he see it, and he looking like, uh, you a big boy. You know what I'm saying? You got a lot behind you. He must have saw that this is not somebody to play around with. So watch, read it again, what he did. And Menahem exacted the money of Israel, even of all the mighty men of wealth, of each man 50 shekels of sil silver to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and stayed not there in the land. So the king of Assyria show up and he looking like, uh, I might just kill y'all. If you want to be king, you'll have to run it up. So then he like, all right, listen, 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 listen. Give me a week. He went out. He took everybody who had some money. He's like, give it up. Everybody got to pay taxes. We send this to Assyria. Then they sent it to Assyria. So the king of Assyria was like, all right, I'll let you breathe. You know what I'm saying? I'll let you live a little bit. Right? So it's a, it's a new head honcho in town. Right? And he walking around and he looking for it. This is called an empire at this point. It's the same thing that uh, Solomon did. If y'all remember when Solomon came in, he started taking over all the nations that was around him. He took over Edom. Well, really, really, uh, David did it. You know what I'm saying? David started taking them over and, and he, he kept it going. Yeah, but when he got in power, he started taxing everybody. He's like, Edom, you got to pay me tribute. Ammon, Moab, the Philistine, everybody around me got to pay me tribute. And then he just kept spreading out and spreading out until he had more territory. That was an empire at that point. Right. Because he had all these different places under his control. So this is exactly what Assyria is beginning to do. They're trying to do this right now. It's the very beginning of it. And this is in history. Like you can read the history books and you can see the exact same thing. The king of Assyria started to go out and conquer nations. So it's like get down or lay down. It's like, yo, you can get down. Right. All you all do to get down. Pay me my money. I'm going to use that. The money that I get from Israel. I'm going to use that to go take over the next nation that tell me, no, nah, we ain't going to pay you nothing. So if the Ammonites come and they be like, 
Nah, man, we ain't paying Assyria nothing. We a fight. Okay, Israel, I need I need to up your taxes a little bit. It's time to go to war. It's the exact same thing that we're dealing with right now, right? There's a war out in Ukraine. They're charging, they pay, we're paying tax dollars that funds that war, right? But America wants that war to be funded because that is territory that they can control. They don't officially control it, but they can control what's going on in Ukraine. So it's like, if Russia take them over, I lose that control. I can't have my bases there. I can't have the American labs there. I can't have none of the stuff that America uses to keep dominance. I can't have it there. Same thing in Japan, right? If we ain't about to let too much happen in Japan because we got bases there. We got a lot of stuff going on in Japan. We have already won that. So all over the world, Iraq, Iran, all these different places, we go in, we conquer, and we set up bases, right? Because that's how we keep control. As long as we got a base, look, if we got a base in Iran, and we got bases in Israel, and we got bases in all these different places, all right, we ain't got no bases in Iran, sorry. If we got bases in, in Iraq, right? And we got bases in I Israel, and all the stuff I'm naming on the map is right around each other. And then say Iran want to act bad on us. We ain't got no bases in that Iran. They won't let us in. But if these boys try to act up, guess what? We're right next door to you. We got people right next door that's always there. So that's how you keep an empire strong. No matter where, I got territory everywhere you go. So if it, if it get, if you act up, I can touch you. You not far away from me. So that's what the king of Assyria is trying to do right now. He's trying to build it up. You need taxes to fund the war. So you take over who you can. You start charging them money just to live. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm charging you just so I don't kill you, right? You collect that money, then you go to the next nation that you think you can take. If they say no, then you take them over. If they say yes, that's better. I ain't got to kill nobody. Just give me the money. And you do that until you're strong enough and strong enough and strong enough. And when you as dominant as you can be, then it ain't even a get down or lay down. It's your boy, get down, trust me. Right. Everybody paying you taxes because everybody know they can't do nothing with you. And that's what we're about to see happen with Assyria. He's about Assyria is about to develop into this huge empire that's about to take over so much of the area. You know what I'm saying? And everybody going to have to deal with that. So let's keep reading. The king of Assyria said, OK, I'll let y'all breathe a little bit. And the rest of the acts of Menahem and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Menahem slept with his fathers. And Pekahiah, his son, reigned in his stead. Right? So now it's about to get hot and heavy. Right? Mm -hmm. It's about to get hot and heavy. So let's look at, let's look real quick at the kings and look at where we are. I want to look at the kings and the prophets, really. Let's look at where we are, right? So if we look at what we're dealing with right now, we just talked about Uzziah. We talked about Zechariah, Shelem, and then Manaam. Right? So we already talked about Jonah. Now we're going to have to talk about Amos next week. Right. Because Amos was prophesying during all of their kingdoms. Right. So we're going to talk about Amos. Then probably the week after that, we'll start dealing with Hosea. We probably won't be able to tackle all of Hosea, but we'll start dealing with some of Hosea. Then we might touch on a little bit of Isaiah. Isaiah is huge. So it's a whole lot to talk about. We're going to be sitting there for a We're going to chew on that one for a long time. Right. Yeah. But we're going to talk about Hosea. You know what I'm saying? All right. We're going to talk about Amos next week. Then we're going to start getting into uh, Hosea. As we do that, we're going to sprinkle in the kings because eventually, what does it say right here? Assyrian captivity is what we're looking at, right? So all of Israel is going to end up going into capti captivity in Assyria. But you can see Assyria came onto the scene right here, right? It doesn't happen right away. It takes it a little while. So we're going to learn about all the things that happen. But what, what the first thing we're going to start to see is we're going to see Amos and Hosea, they're going to be warning us about this, right? They're going to start warning all the people like, yo, 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 this is what's about to happen, right? So in all of our reading, we're going to pay attention to those warnings and we're going to start to learn how the Most High God's prophecy works, right? Amos is about to be the first prophet book where the prophecy is to our people, right? Jonah was the first prophet book, right, that we have documented. But that was to the, the people of Nineveh, right? It was to the people of Nineveh. 
Now we're about to see the first profit book that's to us. We're going to see the differences of it. We're going to see a lot more detail, right? Jonah was more, it's a, it's a lot of narrative in Jonah, right? It's a, it's a lot of narrative kind of telling you how he lived and what happened, you know, stop by stop for in his life. Amos is not so much narrative. There's only a tiny bit of narrative in, in Amos. Amos is all pro, are mostly prophecy, right? It's just saying, thus says Yahuwah, this and such and such is going to happen. And da, 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 da. So we're going to kind of look at it and we're going to see how that ties in. And we're going to kind of compare what we read to what actually happens. But the most exciting piece is we're going to look at the stuff that haven't happened yet. Right. Because those are the things that at any moment we got to deal with. Them. All right. Any questions? Any questions? Why are we never been happy with what we? Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, if we uh we don't have to get it, but if we look back in Genesis, you know what I'm saying, uh 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 one of the things that Jacob, you know what I'm saying, set forth, he told the most high God, he said, Listen, if you make sure I got clothes and food, food and raiment is what he said, you know what I'm saying? You'll be my God. Right? He said, I'll serve you. Listen, I'll serve you. You just make sure I got clothes and food. You'll be my God. So that is important for us. Like we have to be able to be content. The, the, the enemy, the enemy is made being content almost like a, like a shameful thing now. Mm -hmm. Right. These people, these people are like, if you talk to somebody, you just be like, oh yeah, no, nah, my job ain't perfect, but you know, it get me by and to do that. These people are like, no, nah, man, I can't work for nobody. You know what I'm saying? You shouldn't, you shouldn't have to put up the, you know what you should be doing? You should try to open up a business. You should try to do this. You should try to do that. And you should try to, it ain't nothing wrong with opening up a business. It ain't nothing wrong with being an entrepreneur. None of that stuff is wrong, right? Technically, all our people historically have run our own operation, right? We run our own thing. So there's nothing wrong with that. But the idea is nothing is ever enough in that we shouldn't be serving nobody else or we shouldn't be working for somebody else, right? That's the trick. And then even when you get that, it's like, oh, well, let me get more. Oh, I got this much, but let me get more. I bought that, but let me buy more. And it's just a constant yearning for more. And it's, it's, uh, it's vanity. It's empty, right? And that's where, that's, you know what I'm saying? That's where we mess up. So yeah, that's where the temptation is, is that constant need for more. When you can learn how to restrain yourself and say, you know what? Most High God gave me food and he gave me clothes. We good. Right. We good. I got food and I got clothes. After that, whatever come to me, it came to me. But I'm not fighting and clawing and trying to twist no arms to get get, you know, what I'm saying get the next lick. You know what I'm saying? No, that's how you fall. That's how you that's how you fall into being desperate and, you know, what I'm saying doing stuff you ain't got no business doing. All right. We can't live that life. Let me see what else we got. Considering the most high changed his mind, was Jonah really a prophet? Yeah, Jonah was definitely really a prophet because you got to remember what the what what the uh, what the criteria is for a prophet. A prophet, the criteria for a prophet is not necessarily that you do what the Most High God say, right? Hold hold, we got real quick. Go to uh go to Matthew chapter seven. Go to Matthew chapter seven. Give me verse uh, I think twenty one. This is Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he right? He said, not everybody who father. says unto me, Master, Master, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. He said, but what? But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name? Have we not done name, what? Prophesied in thy name. He said, have we not prophesied in thy name? These are people. Look, the illustration that the most high God has given us is somebody who's arguing with them. He's saying it's going to be a lot of people that's calling out like, yo, 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 how, why we can't get in? Right. Didn't we prophesy in your name? This is what they in their mind. They prophesied, and it's not like they were just saying random prophecy. They was like, we prophesied in your darn name. So being a prophet is not, if y'all remember, the first king of Israel, what was his name? The first official king. 
So Jeroboam. Oh, like Saul. Oh. His name was Saul. And if y'all remember, Saul got anointed by Samuel. And after he got anointed, he went down to the prophets. And the book say he began to prophesy. That's book. And the spirit fell on. After that, the kingdom was ripped from the man. The most High God said, you ain't got nothing to do with me. Right. So it's never the, be, to be a prophet. There's one or two things that happen. Most High God speak to you in a vision or most High God speak to you in a dream. That's a that's a prophet. So now what you do with that is different. Right. Like ba Balaam. We read about Balaam. Right. Balaam set our people up. He taught the. Uh, he taught uh, Balak people. He taught he taught them how to set us up. He was like, man, just had a woman go ahead. You know what I'm saying? Oh, them Israelite boy. They love them women. Let me tell you, just go prance by. You know what I'm saying? I bet you they start serving your God. He gave them wicked counsel, the book said. Right. And it worked. But before all that, he was speaking the word of the most high God. Fervently, too. He told you like. I can't say nothing other than what the Most High God said. And guess what? Balaam ended up being rejected. Right? So, yeah, just because Jonah didn't go the right direction in terms of, uh, in terms of the initial commandment from the Most High God, you know what I'm saying, that he's still a prophet. You know what I'm saying? And the Most High God saw fit that his book, you know what I'm saying, would, would serve as an example for us or a lesson for us. What else we got here? Oh, bro, I was asking a question. Mm -hmm. I think that's all up in there. All right. Well, then we about to pray out. I appreciate y'all. Y'all know fellowship, the first fellowship hour is going to be, uh, what is it? Four o'clock Pacific time. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Fellowship Sunday. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, I'm just playing. No, it's going to be tomorrow. Fellowship hour tomorrow is going to be on the Sabbath. It's 4 o'clock, 4 p.m. Pacific time. Um, you know what I'm saying? Try to be a little bit early. I think I sent out the link to everybody I could think to send it out. I posted it to all the pages. So we'll see. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll jump on there. We'll talk for a little bit. Enjoy one another. I'm prepared with any questions that you got or anything that you want to talk about. I'm going to have a few things just to keep the conversation moving. But for, for the most part, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? We'll just, we'll just let the conversation flow naturally and then we'll go from there. I'm excited about it. I appreciate Sister Sharon for the idea, Fellowship Hour. That works. I appreciate everybody participating. So we'll, uh, you know what I'm saying? We'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more tomorrow. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and, oh, do we got another question? Let me see. Drop the link here. Um, I guess I... And do that. Let me see. Where is the link? Boom. Uh, oh, they ain't gonna let me drop the link. They ain't gonna let me drop the link because uh, because I didn't sign into the stream. Um, but uh, I just posted it. Well, you posted yeah. it in there. Yeah. All right. Supposedly, hold on. So brother T gonna drop the link. Is it in there? Yeah. It haven't updated for me yet, but Hold on. might be a delay on my I did it on my phone. I see it on my phone, but uh I don't see it on my desktop. It might it might make me approve it, you know what I'm saying? But if it's anybody if it's anybody that, that, that don't have a link and you wanna get it, if you got my Twitter page, it's on there. If you have my Facebook page or the Tata Y'all Facebook page, it's on um both of those. If you have the, um, what else? 
it's not on the website. Obviously, I should put it on the website. So I'll put it on the website. And other than that, you got the number right here. It's the number, same number on all the videos. Just call or text that number, and I will make sure you get the link. Um, but I appreciate y'all. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and pray out. Uh, yeah, I tried to put the link in, but all right.